Welcome to the Visionary Spotlight, an interview series highlighting business owners, leaders, and entrepreneurs who are visionaries in their fields. They're leading their industries with a track record of excellence and remarkable work. In these conversations, we learn a few of the key steps on each visionary's road to success, how they grew the business, reached their best customers, and what they've learned along the way. I'm Emily Hamelshaver of Lumos Communications, and today I am thrilled to be speaking with Justine Clay, a business coach, writer, and speaker for creative business owners. Justine helps established, service-based entrepreneurs and freelancers grow purposeful and profitable creative businesses. And I worked with Justine in 2021 and can unequivocally say she transformed my business and my mindset. <laughs> more abundance, more creative challenge, more joy, more ease. I don't think I ever thought I'd be able to say that. More ease in my work and my life were the results of our just six months of coaching together. So Justine, you are so fabulous. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Visionary Spotlight. Thank you for having me and what a delightful introduction. Oh you goodness. You could be on TV or something. <laughs> this is our TV. <laughs> That's right. Well, I cannot stop singing your praises as literally everyone I've met in the last year will tell you, but why don't you tell us what you do and what you're, what you're known for? Yes. Well, thank you. So I am a business coach for creator entrepreneurs and freelancers. And my tagline, if you like, is you're creative by nature. Let me help you be profitable by design. Um, I came up as um, a sort of a creatively inclined person, but not in a, a creative industry and sort of had all of that mythology around someone who's creatively inclined, not being good with business or not being good with numbers and definitely not being good with money and that I would probably be destined for some kind of vocational work where it would you know all of those things and so I've gone through my own um, uh, unlearning of those stories and and I think on a mission to help all creatives who cross my path intentionally or not to unpick those stories for themselves because you know my, my belief is a moment spent worrying about money and just having your needs be met is a moment that is taken and stolen not only from you but from the world because you could be doing something with that moment with your creativity with your purpose with your passion with all of these things so that in a nutshell is my i guess my angle on business coaching for creatives oh i love that the idea that you know a moment spent worrying about security and finances is a moment stolen from not only our joy, but right the, the joy that we can expand in the world by doing work that we love, um, especially, you know, I think creative work has such an interesting impact on, on the world around us. And that was one of the things that, that most drew me to you. Um, there were lots of things that drew me to you, your passion, your expertise, you were clearly so great at what you do, but you also had this really interesting early career and unique background as a rep for creative professionals and um, uh, running a creative services agency in Man the Manhattan market. And so you really understood the value of creative work and also how to sell it, which is a, a great key piece in that like more abundance mindset, how to sell this, this thing that's really a value. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I learned you know, during that time that there are two and have continued to have that reinforced since that there's two things that most creatives hate and it's marketing and sales because it's all of the like yeah, right there's the, I, I i i challenge the, like if i could find just a couple of hands not go up i would be amazed because it just feels salesy and icky and and, and all of the things that people don't want to do and you're right that in in the learning of that and it's kind of funny because when i was a rep and i was being taught how to be a rep on the job within an agency so i was completely green and i had all of my own issues around money and value and all of that stuff but because i was representing objectively high level creative talent that had been in the industry some of them 25 30 years at the, at the highest levels if they said to me um, okay, yes, I will write that brand book. Um, I'd like $10,000 for that. And that's not including the commission that you get. And I, the inside, I would be like, how much? <laughs> right? But because it was for someone else and, and I respected them so much 
and I wanted to do right by them and they seemed so secure and I'm just like all right and then I would go and get the $12,500 for the brand book and that made me realize that like yes value is based upon you actually delivering right that there has to be some integrity in it you've got to deliver like the top level product yeah Um, but so much of it is perception Mm -hmm. and if you if you know and believe that it's worth that amount of money and that there are clients and knowing who those clients are that will happily pay that money it's a game changer so I really sort of I was so lucky that I got to um, unlearn a lot of those limiting beliefs and thoughts around money and value and creativity um, because I was doing it for somebody else mm. in a Manhattan market and I was doing it with high level creative so the bar was just so high that that became my new normal yeah so then I started to do it for myself and for other creatives I know what that normal looks like I'm not just sitting here going rah rah you can do it triple your rates I'm like we have to do it with integrity and yeah. purpose for the fear reason for it right mm-hmm. right that perception starts internally that you know the work is great and there's integrity behind it and it's worth it and then there's also this outside piece which is that there is a market for it um yeah it's so great that you got that experience a little bit more objectively um and through that you were able to change your thinking and then share that with people like me Well, yes, and actually, that's a, it's so interesting we're having this conversation because it, it, there's actually a third component to that as well. So there's the, there's the belief that it, it has value and it's worth it. There is a knowledge that um, there is a market for it. But then with that market, that market is high level, right? Yeah. So then there's how do I engage with that market? What are the rules of engagement with that market? What are the tools? What do I need to do to show up? So there's the tactical Yeah delivery of that and, and the engagement of that so you can't like show up and be like all amateurish about it right like you've got to like yeah. show up ready so there's that piece too that I learned through many uh trial and error you know on the job of like messing up while dealing with these sort of like big brands um or just not knowing how to engage with them that that, mm-hmm. that, that rounds out that that um clarity I guess and the confidence that makes a lot of sense. And I, it, to me, it feels like that's been translated into your methodology of working with clients is it is about mindset and it is about market, but it's also about the tactical and how you show up to that market. And that is marketing and sales, but it's also in your own. Um, sort of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's one of the many things I loved about working with you is it wasn't just mindset which was so valuable and that does have to come first but then it was like okay how does this actually look and how does it actually function in my business and outward Um, and that's what I think creates a true holistic change with real legs that takes you beyond the six months of coaching or however long the engagement is 100% agree with you yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely well, let's dive into these next questions because I'm I'm so excited about these because you and I have obviously spent so much time talking about how to grow my business. And now I get to hear all about how you've grown this bountiful coaching practice that you love so much. So tell us what is um, one of the most meaningful actions that you've taken to grow your business? Well, I would actually say that it goes back a ways. So when I started this business originally, it was in response to the 2008-2009 recession. I had my um, creative management agency that was just a couple of years out of the gate and it was going great and then suddenly it was not going great at all. And this idea, and it didn't just come to me like a light bulb moment, it was like, you know, as I've said to you, it's like wrestling the alligator on the ground, you know, to, to like get this idea out, you know, living as a real idea into the world of coaching creators rather than only representing them. So for for about the following sort of four years after that, I had two businesses. And during that time I had a baby and, you know, it was just craziness because when you're a rep, you are a rep for individual independent creative talent. And so you're essentially a a partner in their business. So you're almost like a partner in 10 businesses, right? Like in growing their business. And then I had this other one. So I would feel like I would be like spinning the plates over here and I'd be like, all right, there's a go, over here. And then they stop falling. And, you know, I'd, I'd be going back and forth. 
and like I say, I, you know, I was a new mother and all this stuff too. And I remember getting to the point where um, I said to my husband, I, I, I can only just about sustain the two businesses as they are, but I sure as hell can't grow either of them. And I'm just stretched to, the, to my limits. And, um, and so the, 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 probably the biggest decision I made was to really, uh, my husband and I refer to that as the night of the brutal facts where we sat down and we were just like, okay, let's look at the brutal facts. We just like put it all on the table. And it, it, he started with a question, what do you want? And I said, like, I want a road back. And then by the end of the, by the end of the evening, it was really, um, I, I want to let the agency go and I want to focus on my coaching. And I hadn't before then even been able to admit that to myself, let alone say it out loud to someone else, because I'd worked with these people who tr had trusted me with their careers for so long and I was so close to them and I, and I felt like I would be abandoning them and, and that they would hate me. And I had so much, and, and, and that was the money, making most of the money, the other one was kind of like my pin money business, right? Um, but I just had this feeling of just like, this is where my heart is and this is where my real purpose and impact and, and it felt like a business model that had legs and then could be more flexible with my life, which was changing because I now had a kid and I've since had another one. And, you know, it, it, it just spoke to me in so many ways and the other one felt limiting in so many ways. Um, so really the biggest thing I did to grow my business was to let go of the one that was actually making most of the money and to really take a leap of faith. And then once I did that, you know, and I want to acknowledge the privilege of having a partner, a husband who was making money and could float us uh, for a little bit, not for a lot, like we're, we're definitely a two income household, but we weren't gonna, you know, um, be out on the streets because of that decision. So I wanna put that out there because when people a lot of times have the idea to build a business, they just leave their job and then like suddenly, they don't have the money that they need. And, and that's not cool, right? You need to have money to be able to meet your needs. Um, so that acknowledged, um, but then the plan was with my husband was like, okay, well, we've got like a few months runway. Right. And then like, so then it became, what do I now need to do to really like romp this business up as fast as I can, knowing that it takes time. Like no one builds a business overnight. Like this, my business has been 10 years in the making and I, I, I fully expect it to keep growing and evolving um, you know, as I continue to do it. Um, but like, what do I need to do to get paying clients? What does that look like? What are my activities gonna be? What does it look like to responsibly close the other business? Mm. Um, you know, so, so I think that was probably the biggest thing I ever did was to take such a, a, a leap of faith um, and to sort of get someone else to take it with me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love that you call it the night of the brutal facts because frankly, it can feel brutal to make decisions like that to, you know, let other people down or make changes that are, you know, not the choices that others would make um, that represent a lot of uncertainty in your future, your partner's future, your family's future. <laughs> It, it, it can feel brutal, but like you said, you embraced that feeling of what felt like it was making your heart really full. Like there was real possibility. And that's, mm. I mean, there, I think that business ownership requires a lot of bravery, um, and a commitment, you know, yeah. I think it's bravery, a commitment, but then also like a reality check too. Right. And that's where the brutal facts came in. It's like, yeah. what, what can the expectation be? of this to be a viable business proposition, right? Mm -hmm. So if I had said to my husband, you know what, my heart is really in basket weaving. Like I gotta just like start this basket weaving business. And it would be like, well, okay, how many baskets do we have to make? <laughs> right. Like you know, meet your needs in like the household, you know, city here, right? So the, 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 there's, I think was when, when we are creative and when we're entrepreneurs, we have two things that are amazing and our detriment and that is our optimism mm. and to gloss over like really big things right like it's just like it'll be fine I'm my heart and follow my passion yes but and right and then those were the three months or so of runway and you had to take action <laughs> it's like 
be optimistic, but also be realistic. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Always try to strike that balance with my clients too of like I am unrelentingly enthusiastic. Like you know me, but I'm also firm and fair too. Yeah. And it's like, okay, this is great, but is this the priority right now? Right. Can I challenge your assumption that you must do one more case study to put it on your list? business development and the marketing that you so don't want to do like would that be a better use of your time right and so yeah. I think it's, it, we all need that right we all need that sort of um sort of counterbalance and counter perspective on things yeah yeah I remember at one point you have a very organized um uh, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry that's okay oh I don't know Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe he turned it off. He asked my husband. Yeah. Real life. <laughs> so the, 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 I, the, the, that to just give you your viewers a little backstory that the cleaners arrived and the contractor arrived um, this morning when I wasn't really expecting for this afternoon. So that's what that is. <laughs> that's just what we're rolling with. The good news is, is this kitchen renovation that you've been saving for, dreaming of, planning oh for goodness. now how long has your kitchen been apart three for months. three months it's, ha it's all happening now it's happening it's coming together Emily. <laughs> it looks beautiful <laughs> much like building a business there's the optimism and then there's the realism <laughs> that's it that's right that's right but without all of that like doing the work i wouldn't be having a new kitchen so there's that too right yes absolutely <laughs> Well, tell us at this stage, what have you found works best for you to reach your ideal customers? Or even back then when you had those three months and you were like, okay, where are these clients coming from? Right. Yeah. I think a lot of it, what, what, we, what we do a lot of times is we neglect the network that we have, right? So even just telling people, hey, this is what I'm doing right now. Who do you know that might need that? That to me is a real boots on the ground effort, right? We can have all the dreams. I want to work with this client and that client, the, the wish list clients. Yeah. But if you don't have any in with those clients and you don't have a relationship, that takes time to develop. And you may never get there, but you, you know, but that's going to take time at the very best. Whereas, you know, especially because I was pretty connected in the sort of the New York sort of design world because of what I did. You know, I could say to people, this is what I'm doing. Who do you know? Can you spread the word? Can you say? Now, what that requires of us is we have to be very clear in articulating, this is what I do. This is who I do it for. This is how that looks. This is what the investment is. You know, th and, and that's your positioning, right? So to me, like when you can even, and it can be a work in progress. It doesn't have yeah. to be perfect. But to be able to, um, people with information that is easy for them to remember and pass on or to even identify who might be someone they could refer you to is great. So that I did a lot of that stuff at the beginning. And in fact, a lot of the creatives, um, I think actually my first ever client was referred by one of the creatives I represented, but I was actually so nervous to tell him that I was not doing this anymore because we were so tight for so long. And um, she had actually been on the client side when I had my agency and I was, terrified to coach her because she was so established and high level and I was you know sort of intimidated by her and I thought like what can I possibly have to offer this woman and I and at one point she said to me um so just send me a proposal I'm, I'm ready to send me a proposal and at the time I, char I charged peanuts at the time I mean really um which I still stand by and I we can talk about that later if we talk about pricing or anything but um I remember she said, well, just send me a proposal and outline of what this looks like. And I almost didn't do it because I was so intimidated. There was a bit of me who was just like, run! And then it was just like, no, this is Alex. You can't run from Alex. So I sent her um, an outline. She said, let's do it. We worked together. I was quaking my boots the entire time before the first session. It was such an amazing experience. She got so much out of it. I got so much out of it. She referred other people to me. It was it was probably the best baptism of fire I could have had because it gave me such confidence and I had to step up big time. Like this, I wasn't playing. I couldn't be playing with this woman. And um, 
it was really a gift. But, oops. That's where my story, that's where my story took me. <laughs> it froze up a tiny bit there. Um, I was saying I couldn't, I wasn't sure if I got, if I, if I even remembered what the question was, but that was. Uh... <laughs> oh, well, how, how to reach your, your best customers yeah. and leveraging your network and being able to articulate, like articulate your positioning and then be comfortable going out there, mm -hmm. you know, confident enough to go out there and share it, even when you're a little scared to do so. Yes. Perfectly yeah. synthesized. And to the point of um, being able to sort of back it up, when she said send me a proposal, I had to say, okay, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to cover these areas, right? And so right. I didn't yet know what it was really going to look like. She was my first client. Right. It was right. all a hypothesis. But so, so, so you, that, that's that sort of the active faith and yeah. being willing to take a leap and the, then being willing to back it up with something concrete, even though you know that that's likely to change, it gives both people something to work with. Yeah, at one point we were working together and you said, you know what, there's perfection and then there's imperfect progress. Yeah. And when we wait for perfection, we just never get there. We don't, perfection no. is the biggest scam, you know, it really <laughs> is. It's just like, we all buy into it and it's just, you know, business everything is is an inherently iterative process yeah and when we're iterating, why do we iterate because something's not working right and there's nothing wrong with that in fact it's an opportunity but um it does require looking looking at the brutal facts yeah yeah it's not easy it's not for the faint of heart for sure yeah you're you had said that when um you know you were talking with alex uh, part of you said run um and I think that that's such a good in like like we know in our guts what's an excited and what's a fear and and I think that when they meet that's a really good place because like we could listen to the fear-based thinking that's like I don't I don't want to push myself to do this and therefore I want to run versus I know this is going to be scary, but it represents a huge up level. And I know it's going to be hard, but I know I can do it and I, I need to do it. Um, yeah. And yeah. just paying attention to that is, is not fine. always an easy thing. But when we run, run in the direction we're terrified of, usually good things happen when we've got our wits about us. <laughs> it's, it's really true. And I, yeah. I was on um, uh, the What Works podcast with Tara McMullen yeah. and we were about opportunity and how, how do... I should you know, just in my process of like seeing opportunity, seizing opportunity, and the rest of it. And we talked about how I first moved to the States with a guy I'd been dating for like three months when I moved here, you know, this is like 1996. And I'm not like this like devil may care kind of a gal. It's just like, sure, I'll move to the States with a guy I've just started dating. But I saw the opportunity and and same thing. I was like, of course, yeah. terrified because I'm not, you know, bananas, but there was a part of me that was just like, if I don't take this opportunity, I will always regret it. And it will yeah. only be fear that held me back. I can always just hop on a plane and come home if it doesn't work out. Right. And I and I thought, well, you know, even if it doesn't work out with Alex, like she's not gonna like suddenly like fire me. She's gonna say, Oh, well, what about this? Or I'm expecting this. So like she, she, we're gonna talk about what communications are and I'm gonna get feedback. Yeah. Luckily, it was like so positive that there really wasn't any sort of like even criticism from her at all um but I was sort of prepared for that and even if that I knew she was a professional and if she gave me criticism it would be in a very constructive way and I could only benefit from that mm -hmm. so you know again it's like that instinct and knowing when is it when is this just like a fear where I've got to just put on my big girl pants and get over it yeah <laughs> <laughs> well Thinking of big girl pants, for me, that brings up marketing. So I would love to know what are one to three of the most valuable investments that you've made in your marketing? Now, when I think of investment, I think of not just money. I think of an investment in my time, my energy, my resources. And I would say one of the biggest investments I made in myself was writing. When I was coming up, and I, even when I was at university and college, I, I was told I was a bad writer um, in that they understood what I was trying to say, but I was not articulate in how I was communicating it. Weirdly enough, it's now my preferred way of communicating, and I'm actually 
consider myself to be a very good writer now and, and articulate. So it's so interesting that you can receive feedback when you're 19 and it could be like, well, you're just a bad writer. Well, maybe at that time I was, but one of the things I did when I started my um, um, this business, so this would have been around 2009, 2010, I launched it, I decided I'm going to do a blog and it was the best thing I ever did because A, it forced me to write and I, I learned in that process that I process through writing. So it's actually how I come up with my intellectual property is through the art of writing, through the methodology of writing. Um, so I did that. The second thing is now 10 years in, I would say that like 90 to 95% of the people who land on my calendar for an introductory call found me through organic search. Not because I have great SEO through keywords because I'm in a very highly niche area that doesn't really have a whole bunch of key, you know, hashtags that say, but because I developed long form content for a period of 10 years. Like that's what's keeping me up there in Google. So that was really an investment that paid off. And I remember my husband saying, he's kind of in more of that world of like you know, data and marketing and blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, if not one person read your newsletter in 10 years, which I'm happy to say is not true, um, it still would have been worth doing it. Yeah. The, 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 the benefits you're now reaping now. So I think that that was unwittingly an investment in marketing that I couldn't have foreseen paying off. in my um, uh, positioning as an, a certain authority in this area, not the authority, just one authority. Mm -hmm. area. And in the development of my own specific ideas um, and, yeah. and processes and opinions around the kind of work that we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you start writing because you realized this was a way you wanted to share ideas, process your ideas, develop intellectual property. And then was there a point at which you felt like your results, your, you weren't seeing the results of your efforts or were you always like, I'm gonna do this regardless of whether- I never saw it as a means to an end. Yeah. I, don't think. I think I just yeah. thought this is a way in which I can develop ideas and share them. This was before social media was a thing. And I'm glad yeah. because I'm not really a social media. I, I'm on there, but it's not my jam particularly. Um, and so it was really like, this is a way to build a, 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 an opinion yeah. around something and to work out ideas. So I think it, like, it was probably more subconscious at the time that this is how I process ideas. But really it was more of a way just to sort of like build a positioning where I didn't have one, right? Because um, yeah. I was moving into a completely different field from what I had been in. And to be able to sort of connect through stories and through my ways of communicating that way, how the creative management and representation, I could, I could bring that into this business and it, and it lent it a, a level of like credibility that it wouldn't otherwise have. So mm, yeah. it's really a tool for me to sort of, I, I guess, sort of like craft a narrative um, that wasn't there yet because it was a brand new business. Um, like I say, I think a lot of it was really just very subconscious and very sort of instinctual rather than like um, a calculated move. Which probably worked out for the better for you because you were enjoying the process and not waiting for it to make you money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the love of it is what, you know, grew it into something. I, I found you through an article that you'd written and then I signed up for, it was in March, 2020. So it was about how to sustain your creative business during the beginning of lockdown. And you were giving a talk somewhere. I don't remember where at this point because you speak very widely. <laughs> um, but, and I attended a talk and in, in March of 2020, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna work with her one day. <laughs> then yeah. fast forward to our call in December, 2020, we, we, we began our work together. But um, yeah. it, I'd imagine that that also created a really solid platform of expertise for you then to um, begin speaking as well. Um, and you do share stories so well, I think in both formats. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. When, when did you start doing a lot of speaking? And it, it, it's funny you bring that up because if someone had told me 
don't know, 12 years ago that I would enjoy public speaking because I was terrified. I would I would have loved you out of the room. I was terrified of it just like everybody is. And I and I remember going to with a friend of mine going to like Toastmasters and and when it came to my turn, I, I was disastrous. It was awful. It was shameful. And um and you know I remember there being a sort of a moment where I was invited to give a talk and it was like spark design professionals or something like that. And I remember thinking like feeling really intimidated by it. And I thought, well, and I, and I was allowed to you know, have slides. And so I thought, well, if I have slides, I'll, I'll come up with a presentation, which is essentially like a, a, a post, right? The way I write an article is gonna have like a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. it's, gonna reason. it's not just like, you know, chit chat. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll put it into a presentation. And in the doing of the presentation, because I'm very visual to it as my audience is, and I also recognize if someone's listening and they're seeing things, like that, you, you're kind of hitting them in different ways, you know, they're receiving it in different ways. And in the sort of like trying to put that together into a compelling presentation, I, I, I learned how to structure a talk. And because it took me so long to get the presentation right, so it flowed, I was able to work out the kink where there was an awkward segue or there wasn't a segue at all. And I was then so familiar with my material that I was prepared. And that's what I realized. I don't do well if I'm not prepared. I never show up to a coaching session unprepared. I have read everything that they have, my clients have uploaded. Because then I feel like when I'm prepared, I can be myself. I, I don't try to, I, I'm not, I don't be scripted in the moment. And that's when I do well. So if I can like, just get over that initial sort of like nerves that you have, of course. And I've got my presentation and I know my material so well, then I can really just be with the audience. And it's the same when I'm in a, a coaching session. I want to be able to be 100% present and not be thinking what I'm going to say next. That's the right thing that they need to do. But to really be with the person in, in relationship. And that was like a, a huge shift for me. It's like, if I can be really prepared and know my material well, really well and feel as good as I can possibly feel about this material, then I can be there and I can be in the moment. And, and when I'm with people in the moment, that's me at my best. Mm -hmm. So that's what got over me the hump, over the hump of like the public speaking fear because I, I wasn't then talking at people. I yeah. was like in relationship with people. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and another wonderful example of saying yes to something that was quite scary initially. Oh, yeah. Terrifying. And then yeah. doing doing the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, well, I'm terrified. I'm going to be as prepared as I can be so I can minimize the risk of me just like peeing my pants on stage or something terrible. Right. <laughs> the fear that we all have, you know, like, or something. I don't know. <laughs> I relate to that. Is yeah. Let's let's say yes to the scary thing, but then let's be completely ready to succeed and put in the work so that when that scary moment comes you're able to knock it out of the park yeah you know? and, and that's an interesting thing as well I think that um there's a distinction there because I think that I have no guarantee that I'm not going to knock out of the park I might go there and like they just don't judge me or I'm just not having a good day or whatever but for me my work is done and it's actually there's a, an interesting sort of parallel here if I know I've tried as hard as I can and I've done my best then I really can't be like it will be what it will be. And yeah. I will be able to sleep at night. And I yeah. remember when um, there was the recession and I had my first business. Well, I had both of them, right? No, actually, it was before I had the idea for the coaching business. So I was just in the midst of just like awfulness with the other one. And I had just met um, mm. my now husband. And he worked for a, a, a record company. And, you know, the music industry has been struggling for a long time, you know. And so but people were getting laid off left and right. And every day he went to work, he would like, he, he was just sort of like waiting for the ax to drop. And I remember going into my little office and just like feeling like I didn't have two pennies to rub together. Um, but I remember thinking, I, this is actually great. Like I'm never gonna fire myself. I, I, I know that if I show up and I give it like everything I've got and I try everything I can, I'm good. And so that's sort of always been my sort of thing. like. Do the best you can, be as prepared as you can, and then like it will be what it will be, and you can be fine with whatever that is. Yeah, the rest you can't control anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Um, 
Now, this next question, I usually ask, um, what are your top priorities for building a great team and culture? I know you have a small support staff, so mm -hmm. I'd love to know what that looks like for you, building a great sort of support staff for yourself and a great work culture for you in your business. Yes, that's a great question. Um, I would say clarity, consistency, and collaboration. And I didn't know you were gonna ask me that question, so it sounds like I'm being so prepared my face. <laughs> that was just like really a very happy accident, just that. Um, but so the clarity is like, what are my expectations? What do I need from you? How, what does support look like for me? What does done look like for me? What is my standard of done? You know, to be as clear as I can be so that the other person has the opportunity to meet the expectations. If I don't communicate expectations, they have no hope of meeting them, right? So that's the first thing I think. Um, consistency, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like, say my, my work culture, like they say my team is small, but I'm also thinking about my family at home, right? Like I've got two little kids and it's not that I'm gonna get it right all the time. It's not that things aren't gonna go to hell in a handbasket on occasion or every day. Um, <laughs> maybe that's just me. Um, but I am always consistent. Yeah. And that I think is like, when, when you're clear about what your expectations are and what you need and what, and what you don't need and, um, and, and then you're consistent with it, it gives people um, the grace and the space to you know, fall short or to not yeah. get it quite right. And, and that's okay, yeah. right? Um, and then what was the other one? Communication. Again, that, that I think is, you know, how are we doing? So, yeah. so just be communicative. And I think a lot of that really just, it seems like very simple and basic stuff to me, but it's like, treat the person like a human being, right? They have their own concerns. Did something happen in their family? It's like, you know, so what if they forgot something or there was an error in the subject line? Like they're humans, right? Or so, so to me, it's, I, I think it's, and maybe a lot of this is, is as I've got older as well. And I've also worked with people who were very sort of um, dysfunctional leaders, you know, as, as we all have had that experience. And for the most part, I think it, it felt the worst because I was just, I never knew what I was going to get. I didn't know what that day was going to bring. Mm. And that's the worst feeling for anybody, you know, and, and I didn't know what was expected. So you're always sort of like, you know, on eggshells. Yeah. So I never want that to be, I never want someone to have that experience if they're engaging with me. And that goes for my clients too. Mm -hmm. like, like these are the boundaries. This is how I'm going to shop for you and this is how I'm yeah. going to make you shop for yourself and for me. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that that's probably it, like being really happy around boundaries, what's okay, what's not okay, what done looks like, what good looks like, like mm -hmm. and giving people then the tools that they need. So yeah. for me, like, I'm going to create like the procedures and the processes so that you can then do it. I'm not going to be micromanaging you. I'm not going to be asking, did you do it? I'm going to assume that if I ask you once and you have the tools that you need, then you do it when you need to do it. And if I need to do it at certain times, and even when I email Sherry on the weekends, I always put in like square brackets for Monday. And I, and I say to her like always, you may see 12 emails from me on a weekend. It's only because I'm thinking of things and, and I know that if I don't do it now, I'll forget. I have no expectation that you're gonna look at that, that you're gonna do anything. Same if it's after six o'clock at night, even though she's a virtual assistant, she's not on staff. I'm like, you're a human being that just needs to work regular hours. I never ask how many hours she works. I pay her flat rate every month. I'm, I trust her yeah. and she supports me. And so I think that that's really sort of where I land. It's not super specific, but it's a sort of more of a general way of like, yep, how do we set people up to um, be successful, but not just for me, right? Like, it, yeah. Oh. And to have the, the humanity be seen on a regular basis not to have them be someone who works for me they work with me yeah it's a two-way street and when they succeed you succeed vice that's versa right. yeah that's right. even now i was listening, I'm listening to this audiobook about like um you know parenting and you know like collaborative problem solving and you know anything that's sort of authoritarian usually doesn't go well for anybody <laughs> position whether it's a, a mom or you know an entrepreneur 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, what's something that you wish you'd learned sooner as an entrepreneur? I wish. Oh my God, there's so many things I wish. I <laughs> um, I wish I had learned about boundaries sooner and how to be really clear around boundaries and to feel really good about them and to see them as an act of love for the other person as well as yourself I wish I'd learned to be um, less hard on myself um, and more compassionate and less sort of like if I don't have everything super buttoned up then I've failed miserably um, I wish I'd had more compassion for myself and and um which, as we know, when you're compassionate with yourself, there's more compassion for other people. Um, yeah. I wish I'd learned that I didn't have to have all the answers before someone walked in the room. <laughs> it was okay to be in process and not to know the answers and that everything would be fine. Um, but, you know, I say I wish I'd learned it sooner, but in any, but really I don't even wish I'd learned it sooner. I'm, I'm glad I learned it. Really. Yeah. And, and I feel like we, we, learn, we get the lessons and we learn them when we're ready for them. Mm -hmm. you know maybe I just wasn't ready for them sooner or maybe it wasn't necessary for me to learn it sooner you know maybe it was um uh, a, a gross opportunity in my business or my life that necessitated um a, an unlearning or and a relearning of something mm -hmm. you know? and, yeah. and we know that those lessons usually don't come in pretty packages <laughs> so they're normally pretty brutal <laughs> well so, even yeah, if they can be spaced out, great. You know, <laughs> they're usually pretty rough ones to learn, but I'm always better for them. So um, if I'm better, the business is better. Yeah. And even that is such a, a compassionate and graceful perspective is like, you learned them when you learned them. We can wish we, you know, knew everything at age five, but we don't. And we get there when we get there and that's okay. Yeah, and it's also the opposite, isn't it? To say like, well, I wish I'd learned this when I was five is, is also the opposite of exactly what we're saying, which is you are where you are and it's all good. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that, that's something I've really sort of like learned. Another thing I really learned along the way through the coaching process, which I think has been really helpful for me as just a human being, is that we all learn differently and we all have success that's different for different people. And um, you are where you are and there's never any shame in it. And mm. these are a lot of things that, you know, go counter to all of the things we were told when we were kids. Um, yeah. you know, so to feel like I'm learning those and to feel like I can create the space and say that to somebody else and give them that gift um, feels meaningful to me. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> Oh, well, um, two more questions. Um, the next is, what are your favorite non-negotiable ingredients for living a good life? Oh, you know, I love talking about non-negotiable. So for me, <laughs> enough sleep. I got it. And I don't sleep, I don't sleep excessively. I, I, between seven and eight hours is usually what I get, but like I need it. So that's the first thing. So I will prioritize that. I will literally stop the, a TV show like mid-sentence. I'll be like, I'm going to bed. My husband's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. And that's the exercise for sure. Exercise I do as much for my mental health as anything else. It's, it's what keeps me, um, I always say like, and I don't know if I got this from someone else. If I did, apologies. But like emotion needs motion for me. It's oh. How, yeah, it's how I process. Like if I've had like a particularly rough evening with the kids or something, I wake up and I'm literally just like, go for a swim. Like, my, like there's something inside of me. It's like, you need to swim. And that's how swimming particularly, but walking in nature, um, going to the forest, you know, all of these things are really super important for me to just um, feel alive and connected to everything around me. So there's sleep, exercise. I need time to myself. You know, I, I, I'm someone who can do a lot of things. And because I can do a lot of things, I tend to do a lot of things. I always kind of joke that if I come back as a dog, I'll be the one carrying the newspaper, not the one lying on the porch in the same time. Like, you know, <laughs> and it's not something I'm proud of. Um, so I, I have to be really 
aware of like you need to take time for yourself so I started roller skating and like you know and people are like do you take your kids I'm like no I don't <laughs> they can find their own hobby um, <laughs> um, and time with friends and you know, being in community like these are like I need people and I need the energy of people and I need to feel connected to people otherwise and nature otherwise what's the point of me being here so mm -hmm. I would say that the non-negotiables that like I have to make time for oh I love each one of those <laughs> I also love that you're like my kids can play their own hobbies I gotta you have to you know fulfill your needs so that you can show up also as a great parent and That's take right. them to drum lessons or whatever it is I think one of their things you know yeah. like, too. my oldest kid does horse riding and he loves it so much I think for him it's part horse riding, it's part equine therapy. I really think he's like he's just got this whole thing with the horses. And he for the long time he was just like, why don't you learn to horse ride too? And I'm just like, no, nope, I'm good. You have that, you do that. You can you know, it's like we can all just like do our own thing a little bit, right? I'm happy to run you to horse riding lessons, but I don't need to get my horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just to be on a horse, I'm like, oh! <laughs> you know my hat over my eyes and like you know <laughs> that's right not not the motion that you're talking about when you're yeah. meeting i like to be in charge of the motion <laughs> right not an beast that i cannot control <laughs> yeah yeah horses are yeah pretty pretty wondrous and i i yeah <laughs> right i can look at the and admire it from that <laughs> right <laughs> Oh, uh, well, last question. Um, tell us what's next for you. What's something that you're really excited about? Oh, it, sorry, it froze up there for a second. Did I interrupt you or did were you able to hear that? Well, uh, was it something I'm excited about? Yes, tell us what's next for you, something you're really excited about. Yeah, so this year for me, I think the theme of this year was really working on the infrastructure of the business because I feel like with all businesses, they grow. Um, I, I see the business as a container for the, the, the purpose, the impact, the profitability that you want to you know, create. And those businesses grow to the limits of their container and then you have to configure the container or build an extension or just build a new container. And uh, you know, 2021 really for me was about reviewing the infrastructure of the business, my services, um, how I ran those services. And I spent a, a really long time reconfiguring what the group program looked like um not just from a sort of a logistical um operational sort of side of things but really the space i wanted to create and the mix of people i wanted to invite into that and so this was really a year of kind of like trying that out um you know 2020 was a year of like just wrangling with like what does it look like i don't know and and, and and putting people in there and we're having inviting people in there and, and um working on that and and i'm really excited to see where that can go next year because my my client base has really evolved this year too to really um include people from just really diverse backgrounds and stories and lived experiences and and i love that that to me is just like joy um to be able to support people so and take that impact and um and purpose and change into their own communities and, and make the changes that they want to see in the world. So I'm really excited about really developing that. And I think I had to reach a certain level of, sort of like co comfort and confidence mm -hmm. in my abilities, but also my abilities to sort of fail and to, to fail well. Mm. Iterate, yeah. And to not do harm to others in failing, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it's been a really sort of like wild couple of years, like mm. understatement, right? Um, but I think there's been a lot of like personal growth for me um, as well as business growth. And I'm really excited mm. to sort of see, I feel, feel really good about the container I have now. So now I'm really excited oh. to see where it can go um, from here and where it will, you know, where it will evolve to. Yeah, that's amazing. And when that personal growth is reflected, in everything that we're doing, it can't not create business growth in a really meaningful way. So I'm very excited for everybody who is in that program and is a current client of yours because they can expect 
great things that they're creating in, in you know, their businesses. And then we can expect great things um, that ripple outward from there. That's right. That's the whole. Oh. Yes. Well, tell us your favorite places where people can find you and follow you, and I'll make sure that they're linked below. I think we froze. We froze so again. Gonna, <laughs> we've got this thing where probably I'm not freezing. Probably am. Um, yes. Yeah, so the place to find me is at my website and to join my community. And when people join my community, they get a free guide, which is a seven-step guide to support people in creating their business containers. So if people go to justineclay.com forward slash subscribe, you can become a member of the community and then and, and get that free guide, work through that. And then that's the best way for us to get to know each other and for you to get to know a little bit more about me and my process. And then there's plenty of opportunities to um, connect further from there. Oh, wonderful. And it's an outstanding guide. So I highly recommend people head over to your website to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Justine, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your insight with us. You are just such an inspiring person. I'm so pleased we were able to have this conversation. So thank you. Thank you for creating the space for me to have this talk with you. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Oh, good. Well, to stay in touch with Justine and be the first to see future visionary spotlights, you can click the links below to follow us. And so thank you so much for joining us today. Until next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.